Hello, wonderful people. It's another day and another um, legal discussion. I'm so pleased to come your way this afternoon. We're still discussing RFEs and NOITs. We're still talking, of course, spilling the tea on US immigration law. Welcome, guys. Welcome, everyone that joins this live video. If you watch this later, thank you for joining and a very special welcome to you. Don't forget to subscribe, to like my page, to share my videos. Very thankful for all of you who share my videos and um, keep other people updated. So today we're going to be still talking about the RFEs and NOIDs, N-O-I-Ds, RFEs, Request for Evidence, and NOIDs are Notice of Intent to Deny. Of course, it's all about U.S. immigration law. Um, when you file an application to the USCIS, you may be issued an RFE or a NOID. We started part one yesterday. We'll do a brief summary of what we talked about yesterday, and then we'll go on to today's topic. Okay. So, um, of course, again, let me share my screen. Let me read a couple of, I think we have a comment here. Patrick Addo says, nice to meet you. Good afternoon. Hello, Patrick. Very welcome to this video. Please. Stay tuned and enjoy. Guys, drop me a comment. Let me know where you're watching from. And then I will go on to start and then we'll read some comments. Says, okay, Mr. Francis Gavin has joined us. Thank you so much, Mr. Gavin, for joining. Okay, so guys, I'm just going to go straight into the tea for today. And I'm sharing my screen as always so that you'll see what's going on right here. Okay, so, you know, yesterday we talked about what a 2013 policy was. I have, I had a 2013, um, I gave you guys a 2013 um, brief. So the 20, in 2013, the policy on um, request for evidence or no, it's notice of intent to deny when you filed any type of U.S. immigration application was that um, the officers adjudicating or reviewing officers did not have full discretion. In 2013, their discretion was, you know, guided. It was very um, limited. And so with the 2013, a reviewing officer could only or should only, you know, was only allowed to issue an RFE um, following the no possibility rule. And it just simply meant that they should issue an, they should issue an RFE only if, um, there was no possibility that the deficiency that their officer had um, detected could be cured by additional evidence. So that was known as the no possibility rule, okay? And so here, it just simply meant that yesterday, as I was telling you, um, you know, if, for example, there was somebody filed for an application for her for his a u.s citizen filed an application for his grandfather you know petit, trying to petition for the grandfather with that there was no need to issue an rfe because clearly um there's no benefit in u.s immigration law that allows a u.s citizen to petition or to file for their grandfather there's no such benefit and so you will straight out obtain a statutory denial however if um what you're applying for let's say you're applying for a marriage-based green card and you forget to include the marriage certificate an rfe should be issued because that lack of deficiency can be cured by requesting additional evidence from you so that was the basis of requesting an rfe or additional evidence so the 2013 limited the 2013 policy for rfes and noise limited the um um officers the discretion of the officers however 20, 2018 president trump um the officers were given a very broad very broad discretionary powers and they were allowed to deny without they were allowed to deny requests or applications without requesting for rfes and so the no possibility policy was rescinded it was cancelled they didn't care even if your deficiency could be cured the officer had full discretion to outrightly deny you. And so it displays, this has place because this policy is still ongoing. And, you know, even today, the 2018 policy on RFE and noise is still ongoing. And so if you failed as an applicant or a benefit requester to carry out your burden of actually adducing sufficient evidence to buttress your claim or your petition or your application, 
I'm sorry, your application would be denied. And so that's the whole point of having an attorney review your case because um, there is a burden. Remember, as I've always said, the, the burden of proof is on the benefit requester. It doesn't shift. It's always on the benefit requester. And so you are supposed to, you are responsible for bringing all the evidence to make sure that your petition is approved. And if you don't, the officer had no requirement to issue an RFE. You see, unlike the 2013 policy where he could, he, he, he should issue an RFE, under the 2018 regime where we are at, where the RFEs are not, he's not required to, so he can outwardly stamp denied. You know, he didn't have to issue an RFE and say, oh, go bring your marriage certificate. If you didn't prove that you were married, he was outwardly denying your case, okay? So guys, that's where we're at. Um, now the officers have broader powers. They have, you know, greater discretion. There are no limits. I mean, you know, the, the limits are wider now. So let's continue with the policy memo here. That was just a brief overview of what we talked about yesterday. Let's jump into today's, um, you know, today's scoop. So statutory denials, consistent with USCIS practice and regulations, adjudicators will continue issuing statutory denials when it's appropriate without issuing an RFU or a NOID first, okay? And so this would include any filing in which the applicant, petitioner, or requester has no legal basis for the benefit or request sought. And so it's just like somebody who's living in Ghana, for example, or living in Nigeria or Uganda or South Africa, and then USCIS, which is the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, receives an application from this person living in Ghana. And the person applies for citizenship randomly, just finds the forms online and fills it out, says, look, I'm a teacher in Accra, Ghana, or I'm a teacher in Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria, and I feel like I want to become a U.S. citizen. This applicant doesn't have any basis for applying for U.S. citizenship. They don't have a father who's a U.S. citizen or a husband or has no job that has said, look, we want to file for you. Or in fact, in fact, let's even backtrack. To file for citizenship, you, you need to be a green card holder. Of course, unless of course you um, are a citizen by, you know, you derived it or you acquired it or in one of the other ways where you are, um, you don't have to apply for citizenship, you know, the process of naturalization. Okay, naturalization is what I should say. You need to first of all apply for a green card and so there's no legal basis for somebody who's a teacher in ghana to apply for citizenship without having a green card or without having any type of you know relative who's already a u.s citizen who can file a petition for them or without having won the visa lottery or <clears throat> you using any of the modes okay of of becoming a, 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 a citizen and so if there's no legal basis for your for the benefit you are seeking that will be a flat out denial it will be stamped denied because you know you don't have a basis everything has to have a basis every application that you're filing to the uscis has to have a legal basis so guys remember that you can't just get up and start filing and that's what we're here for again you know we will review your options and let you know what basis is most appropriate to you and what options are available to you okay and sometimes some people will apply for relief under programs that have been terminated. So currently we have um, the Liberian Refugee Immigration um, 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 Immigration and um, Fairness Program, the LRIF. It's given green cards to Liberians who were here since 2014. And the deadline for this program is December 2021. By December 2021, they should have received your application. And so imagine applying for an LRIF January 2022. You will be you will receive a statutory denial because at the at the time um, that program would have been terminated. And so you know there are programs that have been instituted in the past, and then those programs have been terminated. So you cannot file for uh, you know a benefit that is no longer existing. Okay. So examples of cases where the issuance of a denial may be appropriate without prior issuance of an RFE or annoyed include, but are not limited to. So here we're going to be looking at um, what are some of so the certain cases where the law agrees with the officers that look with this one. Don't even waste your time. Just give them a flat out denial. Just don't even try to let them say, oh, bring more evidence or look. I'm issuing you a notice of intent to deny. I'm about to deny you. Do you want to rebut? Do you want to 
um, you know, explain yourself? Do you want to give us, you know, more evidence to change our minds? In these situations, they are not even going to bother with you. They're just going to give you a flat out no. Okay, so please stick with me. Let's go to the instances where you're going to receive a flat out no, and then we try to avoid it. Uh -oh. Guys, I hope you're enjoying the legal tea. I'm spilling it hot this afternoon, so please stick with me. I'm having so much fun explaining the law. This is what I love to do for a living. It's my passion, and oh my goodness, why wouldn't you want me on your case? <laughs> Just dial the number below if you need my help, and we will assist you. So I'm just scrolling up right here. All right, great, great, great. I found it, so let me jump back onto the screen. Let me enlarge it right here for me. Okay. So in these cases, as I said, they're going to give you a flat out no, like no apologies. <laughs> so the first one is that when you file a waiver application, that requires a showing of extreme hardship to a qualifying relative. Okay. So there are certain, there's a, an, a type of application that is known as a waiver. That's the 601. Okay. And so sometimes you may be ineligible for some immigration benefits um because you are inadmissible for example and so if you may be inadmissible on a variety of different grounds so you may be inadmissible because of your health so if you have some contagious diseases like um you know some sort of cough that that, that actually specify diseases that you shouldn't have you know they want to protect the american populace they don't want to bring anybody here and give them a green card if you have some sort of contagious diseases and so normally um for any type of green card application you would need to do the um i693 which is the medical exam and you need to make sure that a doctor has checked you you've been vaccinated you have your vaccine record everything is straight and if they find out that you have one of these diseases that are like not allowed or that render you inadmissible on u.s soil you will be inadmissible and then sometimes you you be you may be inadmissible because of fraud because of misrepresentation because of alien smuggling because of belonging to a totalitarian party because of um, a criminal activity or a criminal conviction or you know things like that so that grounds of inadmissibility but sometimes even though you are inadmissible we can file a waiver on your behalf and this waiver 601 will will be required to show that look we want to waive this ground of inadmissibility you know that we are pleading with the u.s government that look waive this ground because if you make this person inadmissible to become you know let's say a green card holder there would be extreme hardship to their relative this relative has to be a parent a spouse sometimes you know or a child um and these people who will suffer the hardship have to be related to you and so, for example, if you have a spouse who is who has cancer and in the past you committed a crime and because of that, your green card, you are in a, inadmissible to becoming a green card holder in the U.S. And, you know, your spouse is very dependent on you because he has cancer, maybe stage three cancer or what, something. We can file the um, waiver petition and say that, look, this person is inadmissible, but if you let, if you don't, allow him to become a green card holder here and he has to leave the u.s his qualifying relative which is a spouse will suffer extreme hardship so that's the waivers okay and so when you file a waiver and you are claiming extreme hardship to someone and there's no evidence of a qualifying relative so let's say you are inadmissible before because you committed a crime and you're you file a waiver and you see that look i'm inadmissible because president obama like um, he will suffer extreme hardship if I leave the U.S. because I'm also a Kenyan. I also deserve to be here. You are going to flat out get a no. That is going to be a statutory denial, guys, because you need to show extreme hardship to a qualifying relative. The relative, um, the basis of whom you're filing has to be related to you. Like the person has to have a relation to you. The person has to be your parent, your spouse, or your child, okay? And they, in turn, have to be U.S. citizens or green card holders, depending on the situation and everything, okay? And so you can't just file a waiver in vacuum, like just filing a waiver. You'll be denied, okay? The other thing is that family-based petitions um, for family members under categories that are not authorized by statute. And so you have somebody, some people will ask me, oh, 
lawyer, can I file for my nephew? There's no such petition. You cannot file for your nephew as a green card holder. There's absolutely nothing like that, like filing for your nephew. But on the contrary, yes, you can file for your brother. If you're a US citizen, you can file for your sister. That's the F4 preference immigrants category, okay? So if you are filing based on, you know, a visa petition that does not exist or doesn't, is not authorized, you get a flat out no. So if you file, for example, for your um, auntie's, auntie's um, brother or your, your mother's cousin or, you know, your nephew or your niece, that will get a statutory denial. Okay, guys, so that's the ex those are the examples. Drop your comments. I'll be reading comments very soon. So drop them, drop them. Um, officers should check current policy and the operating procedures for additional guidance. Of course, yes, they always have to check all these things um, to make sure that they're, they're not just denying people without knowing the law themselves. Okay, so the other thing is that denials based on lack of sufficient initial evidence. So if all required initial evidence is not submitted with a benefits request, USCIS, in its discretion, may deny the benefits request for failure to establish eligibility based on lack of required initial evidence. So this here, we see a very clear display of the new and current policy for RFE and NOID. And so the issue here is that in the past, um, even if you didn't submit all required initial evidence, well, they, they had to issue you an RFE if, if, if your application could be cured by the extra evidence. But here, in their discretion, they could deny you, you know, for failure to establish the eligibility. Okay, you know, so, so what happens is that normally when you apply for, let's say, an I-130 petition for earlier relative, the initial application, you need to include the initial evidence. Every petition has the initial evidence. The initial evidence would usually establish um, the basis for the request. And so if you're filing on the basis of relation to somebody, that relationship has to be established and it has to be established legally. You can't just say it with your mouth. You need to um, submit evidence that will prove that relationship. Okay. So if you're saying that, look, my mother is a US citizen and so therefore I also deserve to be granted a green card, you need to, as part of your initial evidence, you need to submit proof that yes, your mother actually, she's the one who's going to be the petitioner in this case. Your mother needs to submit proof that yes, the beneficiary is indeed her child. And so that is the initial evidence. And so if she doesn't submit it with her application, USCIS has all the right and all the power to deny. Unlike 2013 where they were told that, look, it should try to issue, be nice. Come on, be nice, guys. Try to issue RFEs and noise. Now they're not being nice. They're not playing nice anymore. So watch out for that. All right, let's scroll down some more. And then I will, guys, I'll read comments very soon. Don't worry, I'm with you. I am with you. This is interactive. So we're chatting. Um... Denials based on lack of sufficient. Okay, I think I've, I've covered this. Okay, then we can um, go to these examples. I think that we might have to continue tomorrow because I don't want the videos to be too long so that um, I sustain your interest. I'm really enjoying this. Just drop me a comment if you're enjoying this video too. I'm enjoying today's video so much. Okay, so examples of filings that may be denied without sending an RFU or annoyed include, but are not limited to. So when the law says include, but are not limited to, this is a non-exhaustive list. It's a very broad list. And these are just examples to give you an idea of what they're talking about. The first one is that waiver applications which are submitted with little to no supporting evidence. Not, not, not. You will be denied. You need, when you're filing a waiver application, as much evidence as you can gather and master just take them all the second one is that cases where the regulations statute form instructions require submission of an official document or other form of evidence establishing eligibility at the time of filing and there's no submission okay so i've worked on noise and rfes where for example again let's talk about um um okay they've given us as an example let's use that for example a family-based petition 
where an affidavit of support, the affidavit of support is the I-864. Guys, I, I did a video on this I-864. Check it out. Um, there's a new, you know, there was a new rule that was supposed to go into effect October 2020 on I-864, but it's been cancelled and rescinded. Um, I did a video on that. Check it out if you're filing anything with affidavit of support included, okay? So if the affidavit of support is, a requ is required and you don't submit it along with the application to adjust your status, which is the form I-485, I you will get a denial, a flat out denial. Okay, so um, again, the officers are, are encouraged to check out policies and make sure that they are, you know, um, being guided accordingly. Okay, so it says additionally, cases any type of litigation that are subject to any court or order or injunction must be addressed under the protocols. Okay, yeah, governing the litigation. So if your matter is in court, that they're going to use um, the, usually the court manual, the executive of um, immigration review. They have a, 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 a manual for courts that they would use for some of these things. So um, if your case is if you if you are in if your case is pending in court or any type of litigation the rules may be different so furthermore certain form um, instructions or regulations may permit applicants petitioners or requesters to file a form before all the required evidence initial evidence is available or may restrict uscis um, authority to deny based solely on the submission of limited evidence okay okay so certain form instructions they're saying that certain form instructions so for certain form instructions or regulations will sometimes allow applicants to file um, a form before all the required um, initial evidence is available, and so you can you can do that, and then um, you know. So, for example, let me give let me try to give an example. So, where let's say you are filing a petition, um, you're saying that look, um, I have there's an abuse. There's, there's an abuse petition. So let's say a VAWA and your husband or whoever is abusing you and you file the VAWA at 9360. And you tell them that, look, I'm divorced. I mean, we're in the process of divorcing. Um, and so, yeah, help me to adjust or whatever. Sometimes they'll tell you, I mean, you just you can just go through the process. And when the divorce certificate is ready, you also send it to the USCIS. I don't know if this is a good example, but this is just trying to clear just trying to bring home the point you know more um clearly i hope it makes sense guys okay uh let's go back here i'm going to scroll down some more and then i think we should end it for today okay yeah we'll do the additional considerations or maybe i should finish no let's do this tomorrow i hope you guys have had fun i just want to keep the, the videos a little bit shorter because otherwise we'll be discussing and spilling so much tea all day so let me make a note here tomorrow is additional considerations and then yeah we'll do that part three let me now hop onto comments guys drop me some comments show me some virtual love and let me come see okay let me pull up this okay i hope you guys had fun and enjoyed this um discussion um <laughs> mr francis gavin says exactly <laughs> mr gavin is speaking french oh my goodness so happy to have you on here majwa papebi edu before says majwa watching from seattle oh seattle people in the house how are you doing majwa i'm so happy to have you here thank you so much for joining um share with your family and your friends and anybody who might need um, an immigration law assistance. Okay. And then Mr. Francis Gavin again showing his approval. I agree. Thank you so much for agreeing. And he says again, Mr. Francis Gavin says, short videos are the best. It makes it easy to digest. Well noted. Yes. So I think I'll be doing more short videos so that I keep your interest. We'll be spilling some more legal tea tomorrow. Just join me, guys. Uh oh. Guys, I had a lot of fun today i hope you guys did we're still discussing rfes and noids request for evidence and notice of intent to deny when you're filing any type of u.s immigration benefit please it's in your own interest to um see a licensed attorney a u.s licensed attorney who can review 
the nuts and bolts of your application and go through everything with a fine tooth comb and make sure that you are not missing any crucial information or you know submitting any inconsistency because as i always say whatever information you're submitting in your applications you're submitting to the u.s government so you need an attorney on your side don't go facing the u.s government by yourself you don't have all the legal ammunition okay so it's always in your interest um to do that it may cost something but it's worth it um some people find that oh they want to save money and then in, at the end of the day they create a huge mess um that becomes really difficult and costly so just make sure you invest in something as important as your green card or citizenship or you know just being able to stay here comfortably in the u.s without fear of um the 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 ice people um ICE detaining you, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, those are the people responsible for apprehending and detaining people who have violated the terms of their immigration status. All right, guys, so I really hope that you all have a wonderful rest of the day. I'll be here if you have any type of US immigration law problem. Give my office a call, 802-7800-564, number right below, take down the number, or you can also go onto my website, akipukulaw.com if you so wish and get in touch with us we'll be happy to assist you um it doesn't matter where you're based we serve and represent clients in all 50 states throughout the us be safe be good keep your mask on get vaccinated wash your hands use your sanitizers and spread some love all right guys so i'll see you again tomorrow take care bye bye